If you have been paying attention to any of the Olympics these past few weeks, one of the things that you hear, the, whether they be the runners or those who throw the javelin or you name the sport, the swimmers, they say there's nothing like hearing the roar of the crowd when they're in the midst of that kind of stadium. And far from being terrifying, it actually is incredibly encouraging as their teammates are cheering them on in what has to be an extraordinarily pressure-filled situation. I mean, literally the world's cameras are on you as you are out there doing the one thing that you, in fact, cannot repeat. Either you make the goal or you don't. And yet, they always talk about how exhilarating it is to receive, to be cheered on in that fashion. That's actually a part of what the writer of Hebrews is saying to these very fearful Christians. The book is really is written to people who are converts. It's called the Epistle to the Hebrews because they originally were people who practiced Judaism. They had come to faith in Jesus Christ, and yet they were, suffer were suffering serious persecution. And there, there was there sort of the issue behind the letter was in part, you know, maybe it would be easier if we go back to Judaism. And we're profoundly wrestling with that issue. And so the whole letter of the Hebrews is meant to be two things. Number one, a very clear sort of layout of how Jesus as God in the flesh and what he has come to inaugurate is better than what they have known in terms of their practice of Judaism. And to talk about, and one of the reasons that, that it's better is because of what they know in terms of the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, what it means to be surrounded by people who literally cheer you on, and to be an encouragement to stand tall even in the face of genuine difficulty. And that's at the heart of even the reading this morning where he says, you're, this is not like, and what he's recalling is an historic incident. What he's recalling is the incident when Moses goes on Mount Sinai right, to receive the Ten Commandments. You may remember your Charlton Heston did. And he said, he said, it's not like that where people were terrified and where God's presence came down upon that mountain in a way that no one was allowed to approach it, even man, neither man nor beast, except for the one that God invited, and that was Moses. And even Moses himself, in the midst of the coming down of the presence of God, says, I am terrified. I mean, this is something worthy of a Steven Spielberg special effects moment. And what the writer is trying to do is draw a contrast. And he said, but, you know, that's, that's not for who you are in Christ at all. Instead, he says, you have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, to the assembly of the firstborn who were enthroned in heaven, and to God the judge, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkling of blood that speaks a better word, than the blood of Abel, which means judgment. In other words, it's an echo. In fact, it's the scripture on which, one of which, that we base the line that you hear every Sunday in the service. Therefore, you can say with me, with what? Angels, archangels, and all the company of heaven. In other words, there's the sense that when we gather together in the name of Jesus Christ for worship, you know, it's not just this group of 80 or 90 people. That's all that we can see with the naked eye. But when Jesus says, and this is one of the reasons I quoted this in the prayer, that when we gather together in his name, quote, quote, he is here. <laughs> but the lovely wonder of it is that he's never alone. Look at it this way. This is actually the Hebrew analogy later in the same chapter. Think of yourself in a stadium. Just like the people in the Olympics. And who's in the stands? Angels. 
archangels, all the company of heaven, people who have been witnesses for the gospel in ages past, people around the world who have had faithfulness to God. All of they are all of them are surrounded, and what are they doing? They're cheering you on. Because you see, you're on the field now. Now it's your turn. You're up. What are you going to do? And for the writer, for the group of Hebrews, they wanted to walk off the field. And what the writer is trying to say to them is, oh no, you're not doing this alone. You are surrounded by legions, thousands and thousands and thousands who are there to cheer you on, to support you. You see, a part of what it means to walk as a Christian is that we literally live simultaneously in two different worlds. We live in the world that we can see, touch, taste, and smell. The world of the senses. And that's what most of us know and experience. But the scripture again and again and again says there is another world. And it's not sort of up there somewhere. It's actually right here. It is the one where we in God, what does it say in Acts? Live and move and have our being. In other words, God is not some up there somewhere, kind of looking down and trying to, you know, being Santa Claus, he's making a list and checking it twice, gotta find out who's not being nice. No, no, no. The whole point of the gospel is that when God comes down to us in Christ Jesus, who is imminently among us, he is saying something very important, not just about who he is, but who God is. Which is why Jesus says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. In other words, we have in our midst the very presence of God that we see in Jesus. And that is in fact the reality, the capital R, that is meant to in fact inform how we think and live. How we live and move and have a view. You see, we, we have this idea, and I want to say to you that I think it's a wicked idea, but it's a pervasive one, that I'm kind of on this planet on my own. And is God existing? Yeah, he exists. Where is he? Well, he may be here up here, but he actually doesn't have any involvement in what's going on in my life. Uh, uh, unless I ask him, and then I don't know whether he's going to answer me or not. It depends on how good I've been. And so I'm really pretty much autonomous and on my own. That is exactly wrong. Wrong. It, it, it's, it's like coming into church this morning, sitting down and you're noticing, you know, who's here and who's not here. You do that, don't you? <laughs> and you think about, well, so-and-so not here. Is he or she ill? Or, oh yeah, that's right, so-and-so is an entrepreneur. Or, other things that may go through your mind or something a little bit more sinister than that. Why aren't they here? What's up? And I, but there's so much more to that. We live in this very space thick with the presence of God. Now when we call upon Him, when we invoke His presence, what we're doing is that we're not actually asking God to go from, you know, planet X to right here in Palm Bay. What we're actually doing is turning the focus of our attention to the God who is already here. We're, in essence, making a conscious decision to connect with the presence of God which is always wherever the world is. He's got the whole world in his hands. So God is just as present in one place as he is in another. But there is that sense, especially in houses of worship, where people have continued to invoke the presence of God again and again. There, it is easier, in essence, to walk in and experience something. But just because I experience something more here, does not mean that he is less present over there. Because you see, the point of what we're doing, and particularly for those who are being confirmed, received, and re reaffirmed, is that they're making commitments to be available for God to use them in the world. 
And if they have any sense at all, that somehow, okay, I'm here, like in this room, with my Christian friends. And so it's a safe place, as it were, to be. But when I go out there, I'm all by myself. So I'm nervous. And I'm feeling alone. And I need some courage to speak up. Because I'm all by myself. That Paul, we often feel that way. It's in fact a misread of what's real. Because what's real is, is that when I'm in a restaurant, or whether I'm gathering with my friends, whether I'm at home, whether I'm out at a mall, whether I'm in my car, in each of those places, I'm still surrounded by angels and archangels and all the company of heaven. I'm still immersed in the presence of God. I am still surrounded by a God who has said very clearly in Jesus, I will never leave you or forsake you. Nothing can take you out of my hand. And that that's not predicated on my geographic location. If I know that, that gives me the strength that I need to step out in those places where I might feel nervous. And, uh, no, no. I, I'm, not, I'm not alone. Where am I? I'm in the presence of God. I don't need to ask Jesus to come join me. He's already here. He is the one in whom I live and who may have my being. I'm surrounded by angels and archangels and all the company of heaven. Take a deep breath. Step back. Because the commitments that you're making this morning and reaffirming your commitments to Christ as these are reaffirming those same commitments are commitments to service. It's a commitment to do something. It's a commitment to actually think about how I behave as I am out in the world in a way that reflects the nature and the character of Jesus. You see, in the Gospel reading, Jesus gets all over the Pharisees. Because what are they doing? Even though they're religious leaders, people who in our day you know, look like Norman me and people like that. The fact of the matter is, is that they had actually so misinterpreted the law that animals were more important than people. They get after Jesus for healing a woman who has been bound by Satan, as Jesus describes her, for 18 years, so she is doubled over. She can't even straighten up. He puts his hand on her, and the Spirit leaves her. She is physically healed in that moment. And the Pharisees are all indignant because he's doing this on the Sabbath, and he says, oh, if you have a, your oxen's in the ditch on the Sabbath, are you going to look at the oxen and say, I'll see you tomorrow it's not sad. No, no, no. You're actually going to help that oxen get out of the ditch. How much more important is this daughter of Abraham, he says. We often live in a world where animals are more important than people. Even us. Doesn't it happen? We're so, we're so um, desensitized to human violence that we can see the worst kinds of things on the news. But when they show the local shot of somebody who's been mistreating dogs and the SPCA is coming in to rescue them, there's something new that touches our hearts with a new kind of tenderness. That says something that we need to ask God to correct. It's, it's out of kilter for a culture to care more about the mistreatment of animals than they do about the wounded, than they do about the broken than they do about the people who are the victims of unjust violence. That's, that's something that actually does not speak well of our culture. Can we be people who says people matter no matter who they are? And our job is to reach out and to care for them. To show that kind of compassion, the compassion that Jesus had for this woman who they couldn't have cared. She's female. That was a strike against her in that culture. Bound by Satan. Oh, something must be bad. She must have done something bad for that to happen to her. She's getting what she deserves. You hear how harsh that sounds? So Jesus is the one that steps in and says, no, this is the daughter of Abraham. And he commands the spirit to leave her and she's healed. So, family of God, 
If we are going to step out with that kind of compassion, we need to know that when we step out like that, we're not by ourselves. That the reality that defines our lives is angels, archangels, all the company of heaven, the presence of God. And when that word of fear comes and speaks to us, you know, what are people going to think or other things like that, we can recognize that as the lie that it is and say, no, I'm here to do the will of God who has promised to never leave me or forsake me. Get away. I would want to say to you, when words like that come your way, those sort of accusatory, fear-filled words, they're just as much from the pit of Satan as the disease that afflicted this woman. Don't give in. Understand who and whose you are. Child of God, born again by the very blood of Jesus, made new in Christ, commissioned by the power of the Holy Spirit to express and show the same kind of care and compassion that we see in Jesus in the reading this morning. Otherwise, how will they see? Tell me, how will they see if they don't see something through you? How will your friends and neighbors know that there's something different about people who say they belong to Christ Jesus unless you act? That's really the invitation. It's it began with the collect. Grant the merciful God that your church being gathered together in unity by your Holy Spirit may show forth your power among all people to the glory of your name. And we all said, Amen. That means, okay God, I'm in. <laughs> so I, I would really urge you to look deeply at the places of fear in your life. Fear of stepping out. Fear of being talked about. And ask God to take those fears away. To put new courage in your life. And to not turn away when you see human suffering. But instead say, okay God, what would you have me that the world may know that the Jesus who we love and adore loves them too. That the world might believe. Amen. Amen.